If you follow the four-step process that we will share in this video, you can literally learn anything in mathematics in a much easier and faster way than traditional methods used by most people, like reading from a super abstract book with bad explanations, for example. If you don't believe me, just try it out right after watching this video and you'll see it by yourself. Okay, let's get to it. Intuition Richard Feynman believed that if you can't explain something in simple terms, you don't understand it. Before jumping into theorems, corollaries, definitions, lemmas, you should start with a very intuitive and even imprecise picture of what the concept or subject you are trying to learn is all about. This easy mental framework will be very useful later on, especially when you study abstract definitions, because it is a quick way of reminding yourself why, so the motivation, this particular concept matters to you, and to keep track of the final goal. In other words, to achieve what you want. By the way, this is a very recurring pattern throughout all mathematics. You want to go from a point A to a point B, and there might be many different paths, sometimes completely non-intuitive and abstract. What happens is that when you are trying to prove something or calculate a result, you end up forgetting in the middle of the road what your initial goal was. A quick mental picture that summarizes your goal, like an imperfect analogy, does help a lot along the way. Beyond that, this initial contact with the concept or the subject that you are studying will dictate your subconscious motivation throughout the whole process. If you get it right, you will be motivated. Because it will become more and more interesting as you study it. Because you will experience this feeling of getting closer and closer to your goal. Say you want to understand what self-adjoint operators on Hilbert spaces are. I mean, it makes sense that you want to study them. They are the backbone of functional analysis, partial differential equations, and operator algebras. They are super important in understanding the structure of Hilbert spaces. In applied math, they are even more important. In quantum mechanics, for example, every observable, so position, momentum, energy, is modeled by a self-adjoint operator because only these give us real eigenvalues. Did you see what was just done? you've been given even more motivation to study it. Now you're probably strongly convinced that this is an important concept to learn and worth your effort to keep paying attention to the video. But what about the intuitive picture? Imagine you're floating in a vast and infinite dimensional space. There are so many things going on that your chimp brain can't really recognize any patterns and therefore everything just looks like a huge mess to you. It seems that there's no well-defined structure, absolutely nothing interesting. This represents a Hilbert space. Now wouldn't it be nice if you had a special lens that filtered out the noise? And depending on the perspective with which you observe this really bizarre space, you could see different and well-defined structures. This lens is the self-adjoint operator. And what you see is the spectrum. Going back to quantum mechanics, which is just to help us grasp the intuition and then go back to pure math, we call this structure observables, because these are the things we can measure in our limited physical world. In other words, a self-adjoint operator is a mathematical object that reveals what's observable about a Hilbert space. Some lenses are really simple. They only show a few axes. Other lenses act like prisms. They break the whole space into a continuous rainbow of components that you can analyze separately. Some lenses are blurry. They distort or return complex measurements. This is not acceptable if you're trying to extract something that's real. If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. Great! I'd say that after this strong, intuitive picture, you're ready to move on to the next step. Concrete examples That's not the time to perform very complex calculations on your own, yet. This is the moment that you connect your beautiful and intuitive but imprecise mental picture with the mathematics we're trying to model. And this is best done by concrete examples. Basically, it's time to get back to Earth. Let's continue with our study of self-adjoint operators so that you will better understand what we mean. The first concrete example is a self-adjoint operator called A on a Hilbert space R2 with the standard inner product. Notice that we still didn't even define rigorously what a Hilbert space or self-adjoint operators are. It doesn't matter yet, since all we want at this point 
is to go back from abstract intuitive land to a more concrete one. This Hilbert space is finite dimensional. Nice, this example won't be hard. Let's calculate the transpose matrix, so rows become columns and vice versa. As you can see, it is still equal to the original matrix, so this is a symmetric matrix. And in finite dimensional real Hilbert spaces, this is the precise definition of self adjoint. But what kind of structure can we see using this lens? Since elements of this particular Hilbert space are vectors of the form xy, then you can calculate its eigenvalues and eigenvectors and find the results. Lambda equals 3, which implies v1 equals 1, 1, the first eigenvector, and lambda equals 1, which implies the second eigenvector 1 minus 1. If you want to see how we calculated these results, check out the PDF link in the description. And if you want to learn more about eigenvectors and eigenvalues, check out this video in the channel. Notice how the fact that the operator is self-adjoint results in real eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Which is awesome because it means that they qualify for a basis for this Hilbert space. You can basically decompose any vector in this Hilbert space as a linear combination of these two eigenvectors, which is a super powerful property. Beyond that, since the operator A is self-adjoint, the spectral theorem says that self-adjointness implies diagonalizability. In other words, in this basis, the matrix becomes 3, 0, 0, 1. In the PDF link, we show in detail how to get to this result. Indeed, 3 and 1 are the eigenvalues we found before. Let's see another concrete example now. The non-self-adjoint operator B shown here on the same Hubert space R2 with the standard inner product. This is like the blurry lens in our analogy, not very useful. Notice a few things. The transpose matrix is not the same as the original one. So B is not symmetric, which implies that B is not self-adjoint. Also, its eigenvalues are real, which is a good thing, but its eigenvectors are not orthogonal. After calculating their dot product, we get minus 1, which is not 0. That's not good. They do not form a basis of the Hilbert space in question. The third example is the prism in our analogy. This is just the diagonalized version of the A operator in the first example. Its eigenvalues are clearly 3 and 1, and its eigenvectors are the elements E1 and E2 of the standard basis of this Hilbert space, so 1, 0 and 0, 1. Every vector x in R2 can be written as a linear combination of these two basis vectors. So the action of P is pure spectral. It stretches in the direction of E1 by 3 and in the direction of E2 by 1. So effectively, it does nothing in the direction of E2. Comparing it with its original operator, A, the matrix was self-adjoint. Yes, but it was not diagonal in the standard basis. So you had to rotate the eigenbasis to see the decomposition. It was a lens that needed adjustment to get the full spectral view. Here, with B, the decomposition is already aligned with the space, so no rotation is needed. Now, for the last concrete example, we'll look at a self-adjoint operator in a Hilbert space, where the elements aren't arrows in space, but are a special kind of function. These are the wave functions used in quantum mechanics. The operator is called the position operator and the Hilbert space we're studying is the space L2. The elements in the space are functions, which are denoted as psi. They depend on the position, x and r, related to where the measurement is being performed. These are usually called wave functions in quantum mechanics, and they have a property that if you compute their modulus squared and then integrate along their whole domain, so all real numbers, the result is a finite number. This is important because in quantum mechanics, the result of this integration is interpreted as the probability of finding this particle or event that you're measuring in each specific region along the x-axis. If this integral diverges to infinity, then it's impossible to normalize this function. 
In other words, it's impossible to multiply it by a constant such that the probability of all possible outcomes add up to 100%. The position operator x will act on a wave function, psi of x. That's how we represent this action. The result, so what the operator x effectively does to the function psi, is to multiply it by the position x. That's all. Pretty simple. Now, why is it considered a self-adjoint operator? And what is the specific lens revealing about the Hilbert space? Well, let's see. The operator is still said to be symmetric just like when dealing with matrices, but in this context, it is represented in the following way. Notice the different positioning of the x operator in the left-hand side with respect to the right-hand side. That's why we say it's symmetric. But being symmetric is not enough for being self-adjoint here. We also need that the domain of the operator x is the same as the domain of the operator x transpose. Actually, this equation is not correct when written this way. The superscript T of transpose is meaningful only when dealing with matrices. But when we're working with operators on Hubert spaces in general, possibly infinite dimensional, we use this notation to indicate symmetry. This symbol here is called a dagger. In linear algebra, X dagger is referred to as the conjugate transpose of a matrix X. In our case, though, in quantum mechanics, X dagger is called the Hermitian adjoint of the operator X. So the two requirements for being self-adjoint in this context are X equals X dagger, and their domain are the same. We don't need to prove, not yet, that the position operator is self-adjoint, but we can confirm that it does satisfy the first condition by picking two concrete examples of functions Psi1 and Psi2 inside of this Hubert space. Let's check the first condition, that the operator is the same as its Hermitian adjoint. Our test functions are Psi1 and Psi2. Computing the left-hand side, we get this integral. And computing the right-hand side, we get the same integral. So both integrals are clearly the same. And the result for both, by the way, is the square root of pi over 4 times the square root of 2. If you want to see how this integral was calculated analytically, check out the PDF link in the description. Great, but what is this lens revealing about the space L2R? The position operator shows that you can organize your wave functions according to position. It shows that this space has a coordinate-wise interpretation, so you can ask how much of the wave function lives near each position. Beyond that, this operator filters out wave functions that grow too fast to infinity. And doing so allows us to focus our attention only on functions that are physically well-behaved. So the result of this integral is finite. Awesome. And at this point, I would say that you are more than ready to move on to the third step in this learning method. Rigor. The first definition, Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is a complete inner product space. That is, a vector space over the real numbers or the complex numbers, equipped with an inner product, such that the norm of an element of this space is the square root of the inner product of this element with itself. And it's complete with respect to its norm. So every Cauchy sequence converges in the Hilbert space. We'll not get into Cauchy sequences here and their convergence. This would be the topic for another video. But anyway, check out the PDF link in the description for more details. The second definition, self-adjoint operators. Let T be a linear operator. We say that T is symmetric if this equation is valid for all Psi and Phi in the domain of T. And we say it is self-adjoint if this equation is valid. So the domain of the operator is the same as the domain of its conjugate transpose. Now, an important theorem, spectral theorem, for bounded self-adjoint operators. Let T be a bounded self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space. Then T equals the integral over sigma of T, where sigma of T is the spectrum of T, of lambda times DE of lambda. Lambda represents the points in the spectrum, and E of lambda is the projection valued measure. The intuition here is that T breaks apart the Hilbert space into orthogonal spectral components.
practice. The last point is to practice as much as possible with a bunch of exercises. We won't have time to solve them here, but we'll read some interesting ones that you can try on your own. And as usual, all of them are solved in detail in the PDF link in the description. So check it out. The first exercise, consider this matrix on R2 with the standard inner product. Your goal is to show that A is self-adjoint, in other words, symmetric. You need to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this operator. You need to verify that the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Then normalize the eigenvectors and write the orthonormal basis. And finally, express A in its diagonalized version. Second exercise, consider the Hilbert space L2 over the closed interval 0, 1. This is the space of square integrable functions on the interval 0, 1, with the inner product shown here. Define the operator T just as the position operator we've seen before. Your goal is to prove that T is symmetric. Then show that T has real spectrum. And finally, find a function f inside of this Hilbert space that is not an eigenfunction of T, but for which the inner product of Tf with f still gives a finite expected value. These results will definitely stretch your mind to make sense of everything we've seen so far, and probably you'll be forced to look up more rigorous definitions in order to solve them. But that's also part of the process. So there you go. The four-step process to learn anything in mathematics as fast and easy as possible. First we start with intuition, go on to concrete examples, then rigor, and finally practice. Don't forget that you can send us your very own research. More details in the description. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there.